Hello, hello, hello. 8 p.m. Wednesday evening only means one thing. It means I am super tired. I uh, went to a concert last night in Philadelphia, about an hour and a half drive away from uh, from where I live and did not get home. Well, didn't get to sleep until probably 1.30 ish, which is quite late for me. Usually I'm out by 10, 30, 11 tops. So uh, a little tired today, but that's what 8 p.m. means for me right now. feels like I am uh, running on close to empty, but nonetheless, that will not prevent me from doing another awesome edition of Taxes and Retirement Live. Specifically this week, uh, today is a mailbag episode. There you go, with a, with a pumpkin now to commemorate the fallness of the time of year. Um, so looking forward to this one. Got, got five or six really good questions. I, I learned uh, a, a, something really interesting myself in researching one of these questions. So thank you everyone for submitting these. Uh, you know, I, I don't do this just to hear myself talk. It, I, I learn a lot from doing this and it helps keep me sharp in um, you know, constantly thinking about this stuff and researching it and it makes me better at, at what I do uh, professionally. So thank you all for that. Um, dad jokes for the evening. Let's see. Uh, when my wife told me that the prime minister of Canada got reelected, I thought she was lying. It's Trudeau. Trudeau. Justin Trudeau, prime minister of Canada. He's like 20 years old or something like that. Or at least he looks like he is. Really young cat. Next, uh, I threw a ball for my dog. It's a bit extravagant, I know, but it was his birthday and he looks great in a tuxedo. You know what I'm saying? Ball. Gala. Gala. And finally, to the person who stole my place in the line... I'm after you now. Like I'm Liam Neeson. I will find you. I will hunt you down. Uh, I'm after you. Okay. Um, dad jokes. Terrible as always. Before we get going, let me remind you all, this video is only general explanations and education. It is not specific tax, legal, or investment advice. Before considering acting on anything you see in this video, first consult with your tax, legal, or investment advisor, which I'm not. I'm just some guy in a black shirt who's, uh, who's tired this evening answering questions about tax efficient retirement planning. Super cool. All right, comments are working. Howdy, period, uh, Dave Fultz. Thank you for showing up as always. Where's Mr. Laugh? All oh, right, yeah, good point, I forgot. So let me replay that last joke for y'all. So it goes a little something like this. To the person who stole my place in the line, I'm after you now. <laughs> Kid's great. There you go, Dave Fultz, uh, especially for you, thank you. Okay, so mailbag. Uh, I will go through the handful of questions I got in advance, and then um, we'll we'll take your questions. Feel free to post them up in the comments. Uh, as always with these mailbags, I ask everyone else, please don't uh, chime in along the way because I, I can't differentiate when I see comments. I don't know who's replying to something else versus posting their own comment. So if it's uh, okay with you all, please um, you know post comments, but other folks don't uh, don't don't reply to them. All right, uh, a real estate one. This one's interesting. I, I, I'm not 100% confident on this, but uh, I'm fairly confident. I did uh, as much as looking up as I could prior to tonight. So question from Marielle Sipman. Uh, hi, Andy. Can you... A couple own a home, which has been a rental since 2014 through December 2021, so the end of this year. They will then live in the home for all of the following two years, 2022 and 2023, and sell it in early 2024. I'd like an understanding of how much of the capital gains can be excluded. Um, so potentially a lot of moving parts here. Great question. Thank you, uh, Mario. Um, hold that thought. Weight update. Yeah, sorry about that. So this is my second week of uh, trying to tell you all my, my weight loss progress so you can help keep me accountable. Not that any of you, I expect any of you to come here and slap me around and put a kettlebell in my hand, but at least by me telling it to the world, hopefully I can keep myself honest with it and, and motivated. So yes, uh, a big week last, last week, surprisingly, a little too much. I'm, I'm 170.4 pounds as of Monday, which is almost a four pound loss from the prior week, which is about six pounds from you know two weeks. So I got to pump the brakes a little bit and slow down. Um, been eating about 1700 calories a day, which, which I know is calorie deficit for me. Clearly, uh, that might be a little too little. So I will, I will try to dial it back in. I'm trying to lose a pound and a half, two pounds per week. If I want to be aggressive. So yeah, um, that's the weight update. Thank you for asking whoever this was. Okay. So going back to Mariel's question, um, when you, when you own a primary residence and you own it and live in it for two out of the last five years, and it doesn't need to be a continuous two, uh, two years, just, you know, cobble together 24 months of ownership and uh, um, actually living in it for, for the prior five years, 
you can exclude up to $250,000 of gain if you're single or $500,000 if you're married and file a joint return. So um, I think a lot of you probably know that, at least at the federal level, state level, you know, it could be a little different, but I'm just talking federal now. So now when you have a rental property, dramatically different tax situation, because uh, it's, it's technically a business. It means it's usually a passive business, but nonetheless a business. And that income is all taxable to you. But against that income, you can net off your expenses like utilities, maintenance, you know, fix up things, depreciation, which I'll touch on in a moment, uh, homeowners insurance whatever, you know, basically any cost that goes into you running, operating, you know, advertising it, flipping tenants, whatever. Those are all deductible expenses against your rental income. And then the net is, is the actual like taxable income you get from that rental. So depreciation is, I think everyone kind of gets that. Depreciation is a big oddball here. So um, it's called a non-cash expense, meaning you buy a property worth X uh, business property has some assumed useful life after which it's deemed like, you know, you've depleted the useful life. It's no longer useful, even though you, you're, you're actually still using it in accounting speak. It has a useful finite life with the rental prop. Most rental properties, it's 27 and a half years is the time through which you depreciate its value or most of its value. Um, you don't depreciate land. Land's not depreciable, but the building itself is and the stuff in it. So along the every year along the way, you're you're able to deduct those depreciation amounts as an expense, which is awesome because you're not actually laying out cash each year for this depreciation, yet you can get a deductible expense for it, which means it lowers your taxable income. Sounds awesome. And it is year to year. But when you go to eventually sell the joint, you have to quote unquote recapture. Technically, it's called unrecapture, but let's just assume you recapture all the depreciation expenses you, you've taken or could have taken, meaning even if you didn't recognize them throughout the years, the IRS will treat it like you did. Uh, you have to add up all those depreciation expenses while you've owned the place and add that back into your income. So if you depreciated $20,000 uh, across the years you owned a rental, you now have to add $20,000 to your taxable income when you go to sell the place, uh, assuming you sell it at a gain, which typically is, is the case. Depreciation uh, is, is, is taxed at your ordinary income rate, but up to 25% caps off there. So what some people do is they own a rental property for however many years and be like, ooh, when I, when I sell this, not only am I going to have to recapture the depreciation, which would be taxable, but I also have to pay tax on any gain I have, you know, buy it at 100, sell it at 200, you have to pay tax on the difference, that's a capital gain, in addition to the depreciation recapture. So some people are like, well, how about this? I'll rent it out for a handful of years and I'll move into it for two years uh, before selling it so I can get this primary homeowner's uh, 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 sale exclusion of 250000 or 500000 I'm going to try to sum it up because this, this is a big topic. But the gist is, um, yes, if you, if you do reside in it for the two years leading up to the sale, you can get the uh, capital gain exclusion of up to two hundred fifty grand if you're single, 500000 if you're married. But you have to prorate the number of years you've lived in it as a residence versus the number of years you rented it. So for example, if you lived in it for the last two years, Mario, and uh, you rented it for uh, seven years, I guess it's actually eight years, um, that's 10 years total, you'll only be able to, uh, th am I thinking about this right? You'll only be able to get two tenths of the gain exemption, the gain exclusion, I believe. Uh, this is where I'm not quite sure. It was kind of a scramble, ran out of time researching this, but the the amount of the 250 or 500K gain exclusion, I believe gets prorated uh, for the number of years you actually lived in it versus the number of years you rented it, right? So in this case, you lived in it two years, rented it for eight, only two tenths of the 10 years were you actually living in it. So you can only uh, exclude two tenths of the 250 or 500,000, I, I believe. The situation is different. If you first lived in it, then decided to turn it into a rental property, then you can uh, still qualify for the full 250 or 500, assuming you meet that, you know, lived it within two out of the last five year thing. The IRS doesn't want people abusing this, which is why you get dinged if it's the opposite. If you rent it first, then move into it, they're more punitive with the gain exemption than they are if you lived it first, then rented it. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that there for now. Now, even with the gain exclusion you can get in your example, that gain exclusion only applies to the actual gain. Depreciation recapture, you're still going to have to pay tax on dollar for dollar. There's no exemption or trimming down of that. 
So let's just assume you, you, you know, there's a hundred thousand dollars of gain and thirty thousand dollars of depreciation recapture. Best case scenario is you can get an exclusion for that hundred thousand dollars of gain, but you will still need to recapture that thirty thousand dollars of depreciation, which again will all be taxed as ordinary income, capped at a rate of twenty five percent. I'll leave it there. Uh, I would definitely recommend if you don't have a tax return prepare, find one. You know, work with one in the year of your sale to make sure this gets uh, accounted for and, and taxed properly, Mario. I, I wouldn't advise doing this yourself tax-wise unless you're very you know, confident in, in your tax abilities and researching this to make sure it's accurate. But all right, uh, great question. Next. Thank you, Mario. Um, Ram, Ram Sunta emailed me. Uh, let me try to sum this up. So a pretty big email, but the gist is he's 74, wife is 65, okay? They both met the five-year uh, Roth IRA. They both had Roth IRAs more than five years, so their withdrawals are qualified at this point. Question is, if he were to die today, again, he's he's nine years older. If he were to die today, his wife has the ability to take his IRA, traditional IRA and make it her own, or she can uh, make it a beneficiary IRA, in which case she can stretch it out over, take, take RMDs, take distributions over her life expectancy. Um, she's still able to do that under the Secure Act. She's one of the few people, few types of people who can still do the stretch IRA is what it's called. So that, that's one. Uh, so the, the question is, why would anyone in, in this scenario, so the older husband dies, younger wife has a choice what to do with the older husband, deceased husband's IRA. Why would anyone want to use the stretch inherited IRA in this case, as opposed to just making it their own? Uh, great question. And Generally, you wouldn't. If, if the surviving spouse is younger than the spouse who died, yes, the surviving spouse, there may be exceptions, but I almost always would, would just want to roll it into his or her own. They then have the flexibility to take you know, distributions as if it was always their own from the get-go. Where the surviving spouse may want to actually take this stretch IRA thing is if the surviving spouse was the older of the two. And here's why. So let's assume the surviving, let's flip the script. Surviving spouse is 74, spouse who died was 65. Surviving spouse is already of RMD age and needs and is or should be taking RMDs on his or her own accounts. Spouse who died was still seven years short of RMD age. Uh, if the surviving spouse were to take the deceased spouse IRA and put it into his or her own, that now is all subject to the surviving spouse's RMDs because surviving spouse is already over 72. On the other hand, if the surviving spouse chose to make an inherited IRA and stretched out the uh, distributions from that IRA, the distributions from that account would not need to start until the deceased spouse would have hit 72. So in this case, deceased spouse died at 65. There's still seven years until RMDs would need to start out of that inherited account, even though the surviving spouse who's inheriting it is already 74, 75, whatever I said. Um, that account, the inherited account, could delay its RMDs until the, the decedent, the deceased spouse, would hit 72. So that would be an example where the uh, survivor would want to choose the inherited IRA option instead of just folding it into his or her own. Uh, question two was, does the SECURE Act have any impact in these scenarios? Um, so th the question you, you posed and the, and the things you referenced were actually already reflective of the, uh, the SECURE Act. Um, because surviving spouse can choose that stretch, that inherited IRA thing. And the third question, are there any different or better solutions to be considered? Uh, impossible to say without knowing your whole facts and circumstances and all the nuances of your personal lives and, you know, finance wise. Uh, not sure, but basically put, yeah, that, 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 you know, if the surviving spouse was the older of the two, then possibly it makes sense to take the stretch inherited IRA as opposed to making it their own. Um, and the other question here was rolling over Roths into the surviving spouse shouldn't have any restrictions or limitations. That's correct. There's there's no RMDs from Roth IRA accounts, including uh, inherited one. Well, I take that back. Um, th that is a different answer, actually. So if the surviving spouse makes an inherited or, or gets a Roth IRA from the deceased spouse and makes it his or her own, there's no RMDs on his or her own Roth IRA. Versus if the surviving spouse took a, an inherited Roth IRA, uh, they're, they're oh man, I'm getting fuzzy on this. I think there are RMDs on that, but they won't be taxable for what it's worth. But I, I do think you would be required to uh, take out RMDs if you do the stretch stretch option. 
uh, versus if you make it your own, there's no RMBs, there's no tax. So that, that's probably almost always the better option. But again, it really depends on your life circumstances and whatever. So, all right. Uh, great question, Ram. Thank you. Next, two from Laura Bruzas. Um, first one, this one's pretty cool. I'll start with this one. Question about FDIC bank insurance limits. So FDIC stands for Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation or something. You've probably heard of it. It's uh, when you have when you have uh, regular bank accounts, checking, savings, CDs in a FDIC insured bank. And in, I forget the exact rules, but I think any bank that has branches across multiple states needs to be federally insured by the FDIC. Any bank that's intrastate only, I think has an option, or at least they used to when I learned that in college 20 plus years ago, maybe that changed. But um, generally speaking, don't use a bank that doesn't have FDIC insurance is, is, is my word of wisdom. So anyway, so FDIC insurance insures up to $250,000 per account, per account holder, per uh, account classification. Um, so what does that mean? So basically, you know, let's keep it simple. You have one checking account at, at Wells Fargo and we're just picking one because there's one across the street. So it came to mind. Um, and you have $240,000 in it. If Wells Fargo were to go bust overnight and completely disappear, your $240,000 is completely insured by the FDIC. They step in. There's a couple ways they pay you out. You know, they, they may swing your account over to another bank or they just cut you a check or something. The point is, rest assured, you'll get your 240 grand. If you had $300,000 in your account and Wells Fargo goes bust, you may lose $50,000 because the insurance is only 250 grand in that case. So your other 50 may be at risk of Wells Fargo drying up and disappearing. Now, that's pretty straightforward. Where it gets, where it gets uh, a little clunkier is that there's different uh, layers. You, you can structure accounts differently to get multiple bits of 250 grand of insurance. It's technically 250,000 per depositor, per institution, per account category, per account ownership category. What do I mean by that? So you're married, let's assume. You have one account in your own single name and as an individual and it's a checking account. You can have up to $250,000 of coverage across all of your individual accounts. You have two checking, five savings, whatever, all in your name individually, 250 grand max across those accounts. Let's assume you and your spouse have a joint account, joint checking account. You can get up to another 250 as a joint party uh, with your spouse. So now I get 250 coverage across my own accounts, 250 max 250 coverage across joint accounts. Here's the other wrinkle. If you have a trust, a revocable trust, for example, each unique beneficiary to that trust, you can get up to 250 grand for each of them. So I open a bank account in the name of my living revocable trust. I have four named uh, beneficiaries of that trust. I can get up to $250,000 of insurance for each of them, which means my trust bank account could have a million dollars in it. And then because there's four beneficiaries at 250 grand of coverage each, that full million dollars will be insured. Uh, you can see how this can get kind of hairy, but there's a really cool tool the FDIC has called EDIE, E-D-I-E, -E, stands for uh, Electronic Deposit Insurance Estimator. I didn't put the website up here, but just Google FDIC Eddie, E-D-I-E, -E, and you'll, you'll find it. You just click on this use Eddie now, this green button thing here, and it'll step you through. You put in all the different accounts you have, who owns it, is it a trust, is it a joint account, is it checking the savings? You put in the dollar amounts you have, and it'll tell you at the bottom, you have you know $2 million in, in this bank and only what 750 is insured, for example. It's a really cool tool. Uh, great, great question, Laura. Um, the, an the definitive answer is that this FDIC Eddie tool for anyone who wants to see how these limits apply to their own uh, particular situation. All right. Next question from uh, from Laura is about I bonds, inflation bonds. First, what are they? So they are a special type of bond issued directly from the government. You can buy them at treasurydirect.gov. It is, uh, in effect, a savings bond, if you will, that pays interest that is indexed to inflation. The interest rate you get has a fixed rate component, which is somewhere between zero and something that's not zero and an inflation based add on to it. So the total rate of interest you get is the sum of the fixed rate component, if any, 
and the inflation component and that the inflation component changes every every uh i actually think both change every six months the fixed rate and the inflation component or at least the inflation does every six months so point is every the interest you earn on these is locked in for six months then you're subject to get a different rate for the following six months um currently the guaranteed interest paid on these things is 3.54 percent per year on, a, on an annual basis so on a semi-annual basis it's 1.77 or something but uh, annualized is 3.54. Th that sounds really high, right? And it is relative to high yield savings accounts that are paying half percent or other low interest stuff. So it sounds great, but it, th 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 there's there's a rub. The rub is e each individual can only buy up to $10,000 of said bonds per year. Uh, and you can't sell them. You can't liquidate out of them within the first year. And if you liquidate out of them within the first five years, you lose, you give up the last three months of interest prior to the date of your sale, which isn't a big ding. I mean, if, if you're getting above average interest on it, so what if you give up three months worth? But point is, they're not as flexible or as liquid as like bank accounts, for example. So that's some of the pullback, uh, the drawbacks. And you can't get a lot of them because you're maxed at 10,000 per year. So if you have $100,000 in cash, you want to invest in these, well, guess what? It's going to take you 10 years to do it. Or if you're married, you and your spouse can each get 10 grand bonds per year. So, so Laura's question was, you can actually buy, or, or how else can you buy uh, other I bonds? Hint, hint. I think, she, you know, she knows the answer. I think she was just feeding it to me to, uh, to bring it up to you all. But in addition to the $10,000 each person can buy directly each year through treasurydirect.gov, you can also get up to $5,000 more per year by way of your tax return. If you have a tax return and you get a refund, you can use that refund to buy up to $5,000 more of I bonds that year, in addition to the 10 you can buy direct. So at most, you can get 15 grand in I bonds per year. Uh, Laura's question was, well, I guess sort of sort of tip she was she was hinting at was, let's assume your tax return isn't going to be a refund this year because you didn't withhold enough, but you want to buy 5,000 of these I bonds, you can, throughout the course of the year, pay more tax than you know you have to, to give yourself, to ultimately get yourself a larger refunded tax return time. So you can then use up to $5,000 of refund to buy up to $5,000 of I bonds in addition to the $10,000 of I bonds you may have bought yourself. So uh, that, that is a pretty cool tactic, Laura. I never really thought about that, but yes, you can intentionally overfund your taxes each year to force yourself to get a refund, to buy I bonds uh, to the tune of up to five grand uh, with your with your tax return refund. Um, if you do want to do that refund option to buy some I bonds, you have to fill out form 8888. That's four eights when you do your tax return and uh, they will they will mail you. I think it's physical bonds in that case. So you buy through treasurydirect.gov, they're electronic. When you do this uh, tax return refund option, I, I believe it's physical bonds and the denominations are like 50 bucks or something. Um, just fun fact, actual rates, as I mentioned, currently the all-in rate on I-bonds is 3.54%, which, which, which is high. The fixed rate component is zero, literally zero. And it's been zero uh, basically since the, the pandemic. Prior to that, it was 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0.1%. Um, ever since the financial crisis of 08, 09, it's been between zero and 0.5% at most for the fixed rate. Added to that fixed rate is the inflation component, which is currently 1.77 for, for the six months, so double that, 3.54. But that is subject to change. So for example, um, as of uh, the uh, November 2020, the, the six-month inflation was only 0.84. So double that. So annually, that's 1.68. So still better than savings accounts were, but you know not nearly as high as it is now. Uh, in May of 2020, it was only 0.53% per six months. So double that, that's 1.06% interest for the year. So anyway, so, so that's I-bonds. Um, they definitely pay above average interest, at least above average compared to bank products, but they're, you can't buy as much as you may want. They're not as flexible as you may like them to be. So not to say they're bad products by any means, but they do have their drawbacks. Um, cool. Great, great two questions, Laura. All right, two more chugging along. Uh, okay, here's a one. I'll say this for last. I, I like this one the best. Okay, so other uh, other question. Arun Gupta. Um, I, I'm paraphrasing here, but the gist is high income. He's in the highest tax bracket currently, self-employed. Um, is there is there any value in doing Roth conversions now? 
most or all of his money is already in tax deferred accounts. He uh, is 54. Should I consider doing conversions? And it's a tough one to say. If, if you're already in the highest tax bracket, you're going to pay 37% federal tax plus whatever state tax uh, you're subject to, which if it's like California or something, it's you know, another 10 plus percent. So maybe not. Unless you have such a, a massive honking amount of tax deferred monies that when you are of retirement or RMD age, you're going to have just like behemoth RMDs, then yeah, then, then maybe you do want to bite the bullet now and do it. If you think you're always going to be in the highest tax bracket, sure, do it now while we know the highest tax bracket is only 37% as opposed to it's going up to 396 uh, in the not too distant future, but otherwise, if you're in the highest bracket, it's it's, it's tough to justify doing. Um, in, in most cases, it's tough to justify doing conversions now. Arun, good question. <sighs> Finally, Dolores Fahey. Uh, this one is really cool. So, um, she was watching and preparing for a retirement webinar by another uh, advisor. Most of it was review, but at the end, they highlighted an example about the benefit of working with a planner. They said that after one spouse was diagnosed with terminal cancer and not expected to live more than a few months, the advisor changed the ownership of the joint taxable brokerage account to be just in the name of the ill spouse alone, so that after the death of the ill spouse, the surviving spouse inherited the funds from the deceased spouse and got a full step up in basis on those funds. This seemed very odd to me. Is this possible? Uh, thank you. So. I never thought about this. And when she when she asked me, I was like, you know what? That it seems like that works on paper, but that's got to be too good to be true. Don't try this at home. Or if you can do it, I have to believe if the IRS ever found out about it after the fact, they, they would retroactively disallow. So the issue is, let, let me step back here. Uh, if you live in a non-community property state, which is most of them, 41 of them, I think, and, and spouses own something jointly. So you have a brokerage account in, in both spouses' names. Uh, each spouse technically owns half of that. But let's assume that account's worth a million dollars and you bought it for dirt cheap. You bought it for a dollar, let's just say, to make the example extreme. So each spouse has $500,000 worth of that account. Each spouse's basis in their respective half is going to be 50 cents, half of the original dollar of basis of that whole account. So each spouse has an equal share in that account with 50 cent basis and $500,000 current value. When one spouse dies, what happens is that deceased spouse's share gets stepped up. Its basis gets stepped up. So the surviving spouse now inherits the deceased spouse half, which gets stepped up in basis to $500,000. The surviving spouse's basis is still the original 50 cents from when he or she first bought it. So now the surviving spouse owns this million dollar account, but the basis now is, is uh, $500,000 and 50 cents. So only half the account value got stepped up. Not bad, but uh, not as good as what this other advisor said someone should do. The recommendation was, well, if you know the spouse is going to die, unfortunately, why not take this joint account, put it, retitle it, put it purely in the, the sick spouse's name. So he or she owns it individually, such that when that spouse dies, that whole account gets stepped up when the surviving spouse inherits it because the surviving spouse doesn't already own any of it. It's the other spouse that owned it. That spouse dies. The whole thing gets stepped up to a million dollars in the hands of the surviving spouse. On paper, it looks phenomenal. And this is what that advisor was saying. But after doing some research, this does not work. And here's why. The IRS already uh, you know, became hip to this trick. And it does say in the tax code, section 1014, section E, or 1019, section E, for those of you playing along at home, says that if uh, if you do retitle it and the spouse dies within 12 months of that, you can't get full step up in basis, right? So they, they got ahead of it. Say, no, like if you're terminally ill, you're not going to make it more than a year. Um, they, they don't want people gaming these basis rules. So you can't just simply give it all to the sixth spouse and then get it back upon the spouse's death. Uh, unless, like I said, the, the death of the spouse is more than a year after you do the title transfer. In that case, it's okay and it works. You, the, you can get the full step up in basis. But I guess, you know, if, if someone's terminally ill, you, you know they're going to pass, chances are it, it may not, you know, they may not last a year, unfortunately. So I guess that's why the IRS put this one-year timeline around it. So great thought, um, definitely creative, but does not work. 
um, will backfire unless, again, the six spouse lives longer than a year after the date of the retitling. Only then will it work. So take that back to the other advisor, uh, Dolores, and say, hey, guys, did you know about this? Um, I'm, I'm assuming they didn't. And they're going to they're giving out bum advice and people are getting really burned on this. All right. That's it for the uh, preloaded questions. So uh, thank you. Not too bad. Half hour. Great questions. I talk a lot. Sorry. Let me get a drink and we'll go through the rest of them. Let's do it. Um, okay. Starting at the top. Uh, I like this person. Great progress on the weight loss. Unfortunately, you seem to be giving it to me. Sorry. Um, okay. Yeah, for what it's worth, I, I, I cut out sweet. I mean, other than limiting my calories a lot, I was probably averaging 2,500 a day, 4,000 on weekends, uh, partying. But cutting it to 1,700 does a lot and cut out sweets. First few days were rough. At this point, it's been two weeks without sweets, and and I don't miss them. Thankfully, I guess I'm you know I'm out of the habit. Uh, where are we? Sorry. What's this? My June estimate for federal, I guess federal income tax didn't clear. Will I get a penalty? I increased my Fed withholdings in my paycheck. If you can prove you sent it, so if you mailed it, uh, hopefully you you did it something with tracking. It's the date that it's postmarked, is when it's deemed submitted. In that case, yes, you have a defensible payment. Um, the IRS is real back, backlogged with between people not in offices and just you know loads of mail sitting in trucks apparently that they're not getting to. Returns are back they're backed up on. Uh, tax code changes in the last few years have been have been nuts. So there's a lot of work there processing and implementing tax code changes. I do not uh, envy the IRS. It, it's easy to to bash them and say how poor of a job they're doing, which they are, but to their defense, they're just so overwhelmed, unfortunately. So anyway, um, if you have a, a proof of receipt of, of when it's postmarked, that's good. Or if you did it electronically, there's no reason they shouldn't have gotten it. If you did not do something with tracking, uh, so you can't, uh, you can't categorically, you know, prove that yes, it was postmarked as of this date, then, then yeah, you're kind of stuck. It's your word versus theirs. Maybe it did get lost, in which case uh, they did not get it. So, uh, whether or not you get a penalty, hard to say. It depends how much other tax you withheld or, or paid throughout the year. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. That's beyond the scope of this, but um, it's it's possible. Uh, 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 something about rentals. I was just researching this. The rent must be at market rate in order to treat unit you know, as a rental property and deduct it. If market rate is less than that, you can count the income. Yes, correct. Right. Okay. On renting your home, if you live in it for the First, then rent then blah, 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 blah. Okay, so if you're renting your home, if you live in it first for some years, then rent it for 10 years and live in it for two more, are the cap gains still prorated the same way? Uh, I, I don't know. There's changes in rules around 2009. If you lived and or rented it pre or post, that there was changes. I, I really don't know enough about it. I, I know enough to know I'm not an expert in um, uh, you know selling rentals and how it's treated, especially if you've owned it a long time. But uh, I really don't know. I think you would have to add together. I, I don't know. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to make something up at this point. Uh, great question, Teresa, but I'm, I'm not sure. So if someone did not deduct appreciation for 10 years, what is it? The fixed, the, uh, what is the fixed? Amended return for those 10 years? Uh, yeah, if you want to. So like I said, the amount of depreciation recaptures, the amount of depreciation you did expense or could have expensed. So there's, there's basically no reason for you to not expense it along the way because you're leaving deductions, you're leaving money on the table. If you realize that after the fact, 10 years in, oops, I never, depreci I never deducted depreciation, yet I'm going to get zonked for it and having to recapture it when I sell it. Yeah, the, on the only answer is go back and amend it. But um, you can only amend returns back three years, I think. Yeah, three years. Uh, so you 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 miss that boat. You can still amend the last few years of returns, but you can't go back four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years and amend returns there. Um, so that ship has sailed, unfortunately. Three years is the furthest back you can amend a return for additional uh, refund or you know reduce your taxes. Okay, I don't know what this is referenced to. You file form thirty one fifteen. I guess this is in regards to rentals, but yeah, I. I Rentals are squirrely, especially when you sell it and you lived in it. So I, I personally own two rentals. I sold one last year, sold one this year. I do my own taxes, and, and that's a pretty straightforward case. It's when you live in it at some point. That's when things get a little little hairy, and uh, I'd like to avoid that personally and professionally. So uh, 
right? Work with someone who knows what they're doing with this. Intermittent fasting. Yeah, for what it's worth, I do uh, calorie deficit most days and then gorge more than I should a day or two a week. But it's been working so far. And it's, it's what's worked in the past when I was on a, a weight loss thing. Anyway, if the surviving spouse is well under 59 and a half and needed additional income, wouldn't it be beneficial for her to take the IRA as an inherited so she can get access to the IRA funds? That's a good point. Um, so if you're younger, uh, no, no, because when you inherit an account, the uh, withdrawals from that account are not subject to the 10% penalty. So uh, inheriting is one of the exceptions to the 10% penalty rule. Um, so that does not matter. You know, if you're 40 years old, you inherit an account from a parent or spouse. Let's say your spouse was 70. Uh, you're, you're 40. You inherit the account. You're well under 59 and a half. But from that inherited account, you can tap without penalty. You still have to pay tax, but you, you won't have any penalty at least. Uh, Facebook user. Hi, this is Janet Murphy. Hi, Janet. I'm 65 and planning to retire at the end of this year. I have a 403B with TIA CREF and I have a significant amount of pre-tax dollars in the account. I'm checking to see if I have total control of my contributions. And if I do, would it be better to roll over the funds to an IRA within TIA CREF or roll it out of TIA CREF to a brokerage account IRA? I'd eventually like to convert some traditional IRA dollars to Roth IRA. It would be better to leave money in the 403B. Um, Great question. I mean, I, I can't give any advice specific to you simply because I don't know you and your circumstances and the plan and blah, blah, blah. Um, let me just take this off screen so, so you can see me. Basically, just as you have a 403B, you want to try to roll some out. Should you roll some out or not? Um, you're 65, not yet retired, but you will. So a few things here. Um, while you're still employed, you can see if they'll let you do an in-service rollover out. If they won't, then this is all no, because you can't transfer money out while you're still employed anyway. But if they can, then sure, then you, you can, um, you know, potentially roll some out to an IRA. Is it better to do that as opposed to keep it in the, in the plan? I, again, I, I can't say for certain without knowing you and your plan and the details of it. But generally speaking, um, IRA shouldn't be any worse for you in almost all scenarios because, Fees can be exceptionally low. You know, the account fee itself will typically be zero depending where you open the account. The things you buy and sell in it, you know, you, you have kind of free reign with what uh, publicly traded instruments you buy and sell in there. So you can buy whatever you want, including super low cost stuff. So chances are the fees and expenses associated with the IRA will be lower than what they are in your 403B. Um, if there's any benefits you have in your 403B, like uh, free access to an advisor or something, maybe you want to keep some there for that. Uh, if you have a stable value fund, which is a guaranteed interest, typically higher than bank level interest fund, maybe you want to keep money there to keep it invested in the stable value. Uh, after you retire, then you do have full discretion to roll the whole thing out. Now, we need to know what's in your 403B. Um, you know, if you have annuity options in there and you want or need to uh, annuitize some of your income and give yourself a, you know, basically a monthly paycheck for life, a, a pension-like stream of income, then maybe you do want to keep summer all of it in your 403B, uh, convert that to whatever uh, annuitizing options you have within the account versus if you roll it out to an IRA, you, you may be missing out on uh, those potentially favorable annuitization options uh, versus annuities you'd be able to buy on your own in the outside world in an IRA it may not be as good. So, um, not easy to answer. There's too many things to consider, too many possible moving moving parts. Uh, great question, but that this would be worth working with an advisor, even if it's just hourly, to have him or her dig through the plan and the options and your own income needs and projections and stuff like that, Janet, to, to see what makes the most sense for you. Next. Uh, let's make it the last question for now. Defaults. What would be the deciding factors in doing a Roth conversion versus tax gain harvesting? Oh man, that's a tough one. Defaults. Come on, man. Um, just kidding. Yeah. You know, I don't have a great answer and, and I don't know that there is one. I mean, my, my approach to income distributions and tax management each year is take each year as it comes meaning your income is going to be a little different every year. You know, maybe you, you retire and you plan on not having any wages, but guess what? A year into retirement, you, you're bored stiff and you go back to work making 50 grand a year or whatever. 
that's going to alter your plans of what you do in terms of conversions or IRA distributions or, or uh, you know, selling things in taxable account. Tax legislation changes, obviously. You know, we know changes are coming. Financial markets change. So anyway, any given year, I, 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 I yeah, I, my approach is you have to have some flexibility with where you get your income from, when and why um, to take advantage of what makes the most sense at the time. But why would you do Roth conversion versus tax gain harvesting? Uh, I mean, first thing comes to mind, defaults is if you have a really large balance of tax deferred monies, uh, the the extent of your possible future tax issues, you know, large future taxes in, in uh, down the road, it may be more worth it for you to help minimize and trim down your future taxes from large RMDs, for example, by doing conversions today, as opposed to not doing conversions and instead, uh, you know, selling some uh, some some gains in your brokerage account, some taxable gains. Um, really all depends. I, I don't know that anyone could ever give a quantifiably right answer because this this does involve some pretty heavy speculation, educated guessing about the future uh, on many fronts. So um, and no one knows for sure what's going to happen with tax legislation with your own life circumstances, with financial markets, with uh, inflation, um, with financial market returns. So that's a tough one, defaults. I, I kind of feel like the answer is, well, I'll know it when I see it. But outside of that, I, I I don't have any like black and white guidance as to when you would do one versus the other. Other than, again, the context, if you have really large tax deferred accounts, you may want to work on getting those down by way of Roth conversion as opposed to doing other things. Can you give an example of tax gain harvesting? Um, right. So it's a few things. I mean, the, the, the most beneficial one is there are if your total taxable income is below certain levels, like if you're single and your taxable income is below uh, 40-ish thousand dollars, inclusive of any taxable gains you have. So if your total taxable income, inclusive of gains, is below $40,000, any of those taxable gains are taxed at zero. So you can have some appreciated securities in a brokerage account that uh, you sell when you're in a low tax year, and you can pay zero federal income tax on those gains. States, who knows, but federal, at least you can pay zero. Um, if your, uh, taxable income is between 40 and 40 ish and $445,000, any taxable gains within that are taxed at 15%. Long-term capital gains are taxed at 15%. And then anything over that is currently taxed at 20, which may be going up to 25 at some point, uh, based on those proposed changes we mentioned last week. So tax gain harvested is simply, if, if you're in a low tax year, and you can get away with paying only 0% tax, for example, on your long-term capital gains, maybe you harvest some of those gains. You intentionally sell some of them to have them taxed at zero. And if you like the position, you want us to hold it, you can simply go back and rebuy into it the next day. You're just taking some of those gains off the table, doing it tax efficiently by paying 0% tax on it while you can, resetting your basis by, by buying it at the new higher level so that any gains you have going forward are gonna be you know lower because you already took some off the table and, and harvested them. So that's tax gain harvesting. Um, I'm trying to think if there's other other uses of that term or other meanings of that term. Probably is. I'm not really thinking 100% clearly right now. Uh, but that's that's sort of the prime example is what I just mentioned is selling things when you're at like the zero percent tax bracket, for example. Good question, uh, Mario. Taxable gains may one day get a step up. So yeah, uh, step up basis we touched on simply, um, you know, non-qualified assets. So things that aren't IRAs, Roth IRAs, 403Bs, 401Ks, the value gets stepped up. Whatever gain it is in your hands, unrealized gain in your hands, when you leave it to someone, all that gain magically goes away. Uh, no one pays tax on it. The person who inherited it, um, you know, it's as if they bought it for the value that that position was on the date of your death. They're only taxed on gains above and beyond that price now going forward. That's a step up. That was one of the proposals from Biden to uh, reduce or remove the step up in basis. Thankfully, in the draft legislation that was put forth last week, yeah, last week, there was no mention of changing or getting rid of step up in basis, which is good. I'm super happy about that. Um, that's a good thing. Anyway, uh, Dolores, I have a traditional... IRA that has all non-deductible contributions. Cool. It is 10 years old. There are earnings. If I was to roll that over to a Roth IRA, technically convert, not roll, but convert, would I be subject to the pro rata rule? Definitely yes, Dolores. 
So let's put some basic math to this. Let's assume you have uh, uh, $70,000 of non-deductible contributions. That's your quote unquote basis. You will not be taxed on that 70,000 again if you distribute it or convert it to a Roth, but you have $30,000 of gains on that 70,000. So your IRA in total is $100,000. 30,000 is pre-tax gains. 70,000 is already taxed uh, contributions. Every dollar you convert or distribute, 30% of it will be taxable and 70% will be non-taxable. That's the pro rata rule. Um, there's not a lot of ways around that. The only real sort of trick to, to split out the pre-tax and after-tax is if you have a non-IRA employer retirement plan, such as a 401k, 403b, that you're allowed to roll money into, you can roll in the $30,000 of pre-tax gains, leaving behind just the $70,000 of, uh, of already tax contributions. Then you can convert that $70,000 to a Roth IRA. There'll be no tax on that because all $70,000 is pre-tax. You would have, in effect, sifted out the $30,000 of pre-tax money by putting it into your, your employer plan, uh, siphoning off and leaving behind the $70,000 of after-tax, which you can convert. But if you don't have access to a 401k, 403b, then this is, you know, you can't do this. So uh, forget I said that. But yes, you will be subject to the pro rata rule. Uh, okay. Any other questions? Stick around for a little more here. Um, it is 846. Not too bad. Just seeing if I missed anything here. Um, yeah, the rental question. Sorry, sorry about the answer, Mario. Um, great question. I'm not 100% confident in my answer. I, I do know there's, you can get some of the exclusion, but it'll be prorated to some extent uh, because you rented it first, then lived in it second because the IRS knows why people live in rentals for those two years to try to uh, get around and minimize some of these taxes in the sale. So I, I'm pretty certain they do make you prorate the uh, capital gain exclusion you, you'd be able to get. Um, any other questions? Looks like no. I'll hang out for 15 more seconds here. Next week's topic, uh, more about how capital gains are taxed. So we'll discuss that. Ooh, hold on, question. Do I bonds get a step up cost after the owner dies? Um, that's a good question. I, I, I think I bonds trade at, at par. So you buy a $50 I bond today, you pay $50, you get a bond worth $50. Um, I'm not 100% certain, but but I, I don't believe the bond's price goes up. What happens is that that $50 bond that you own simply throws off interest uh, every six, I think, I think it actually pays every month, throws off interest every month. You're taxed on that interest as you get it, just like a bank account, for example. You put $100 in a bank, you, you, know, you, you get a dollar of interest, you pay tax on that dollar. You're taxed on that interest as it's earned. The bond price itself, I think, stays pegged at $50. So when you do go to sell it, th there is no gain. You just simply redeem out of your $50 bond. There's no capital gain or loss. You simply got paid taxable interest along the way. So when you when you pass and you leave it to someone, th there's no gain per se to be stepped up. They'll just inherit it at the same $50 that you paid for it. Now in the heir's hands, they'll continue. They'll be the ones to continue to get the interest. So they'll pay tax on the interest going forward. But I, I don't believe there's any gain to be uh, stepped up. Um, what's this Dave Meyer says, I bonds all accrue interest. Do you mean accrue in that you buy it like a zero coupon? You, uh, you buy it, you know, below 50 bucks, get redeemed at 50, or you just mean the interest is, is accrued monthly, but paid out six months or annually, uh, Dave Myers. I, I, I really don't know the answer to that. The genuine question. I was pretty certain you, you buy them at face value, sell them at face value. I didn't think there were like zero coupon bonds in that sense, but. I don't know how frequently they pay out interest. I thought it was monthly, or at least they're calced monthly, I think. Maybe they only pay out six months or every year. Uh, I believe you can elect the taxation on I-bonds, either pay annual or pay at redemption. The interest in the latter case does get added to the initial value. Treasury Direct has really good FAQ on this. Not to step up, okay. Uh, similarly, US Series I-bonds accrue interest. There are no capital gains. Okay, right. When you cash them out, the interest... The increase in value is all in Okay, right. So yeah, so I guess there is no step up. It's all the interest to be paid out upon um, or realized, I guess, upon the death of the person when the bonds. 
or maybe the bond terminates. I don't, I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud. I don't, can you inherit an I bond, or does the bond I bond stop once the original owner stops, and all the interest that accrued gets paid out to the estate at that point? I don't know. I can tell how much I don't know about I bonds. Uh, okay, looks like this is it then. So thank you all again. Next week, capital gains. We'll talk about the stacking concept. A lot of people don't, uh, rightfully so. Um, don't quite digest how capital gains are taxed, how, you know, some could be at zero, some could be at 15, some could be at 20, how they work relative to the rest of your ordinary income. Well, there's a stacking concept. I'll try to come up with a cool graphic. I think there's places I already have it. I should probably just steal a graphic um, to show this, this stacking idea, which will very much bring to life the visualization of how these things ultimately end up being taxed. I bonds may have named beneficiaries. Okay, good. Thank you for that, uh, Dave Myers. All right, that's a wrap. Uh, I will see you all next week. Thanks for watching. Take care.